It's showtime. We call it Bring It In, Stroops. Special show from home and quarantine. And look, there's David Thorpe and today's special guest, Scott Eden. Scott, how the heck are you? I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Hanging in yeah. there. We're both in New Jersey and you have five-year-old twins who might appear. I kind of, I'm, I'm hoping they do. If they do come, it won't be, it'll be that direction. <laughs> okay. So it won't be from that direction. <laughs> Is there any chance they'll have like a sword or like a an exciting implement that would be fun yeah like, uh, <laughs> toy lightsabers you know or yeah. whatever yeah bashing me okay i'm gonna read some braggy things about you um this is scott eden his story the prosecution of tabo won a 2017 new york press club award and a 2017 national association of black journalists award for investigative reporting we're going to talk a lot about that in a second um they're written for everyone gq wired men's health the believer um his work has been featured in best american sports writing um a contributing writer to ESPN and the author of the book Touchdown Jesus, which I gather is about football, which we don't really follow. Um, Correct. Yes. Uh, his story, No One Walks Off the Island, which I think is about baseball, also something it's, we don't talk about here, um, was a finalist for the 2015 National Magazine Award in reporting. Um, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Those are the highlights for sure. So this Cephalosha story was a huge deal. I mean, it was just, it's a beautiful story and you spent forever on it. And I think we ran at ESPN twice because there were two different moments. I think it was when you wrote it and then again when, uh, maybe when Cephalosha sued the NYPD, I think it was the other explanation. Right, yep, um, right. Now that our eyes are open anew to the police and these issues, um, I'm wondering if we could just, just tell us what happened. Remind us again, what happened with Tabo Cephalosha? Take all the time in the world. I don't care if you talk for an hour straight. Please, please, don't leave nothing out, sir. Right. Yes, so... Um, and like I was telling you guys earlier, I, this is the first time I've read, the, I, I reread the piece just uh, a few moments ago, probably for the first time since we closed that issue in 2015. But did you get a little tingly? Uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty good story. It's a pretty good story. <laughs> Thanks to, to my editors at the magazine. They always do a wonderful yeah. job. Um, but yeah, Tabo Cephalosha, kind of a bench player, a defensive, right? Super good defensive player for the Hawks. They were in the middle of a playoff run that year. And they were in the playoffs, so it was like spring, April, right, of, of the 2015. Um, and he is in New York City, I guess, to play the Knicks um, after having coming off a game against the Phoenix Suns. So he, they just flew in. It was, light, it was late. He uh, couldn't fall asleep, so he and his buddy um, – what, what's his name again? Uh, the uh, – the Macedonian player, and I'm blanking on his yeah, name. Yeah, I'm coming now, to it. Uh, Hero. Hero Antic. Antic, as I say? Right. Yes. Yes, Antic. He's in the EuroLeague now. Yeah. 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 So they go, they decide to go uh, and meet a friend of theirs who's a sports agent uh, at a, like this kind of famous nightclub in Chelsea, neighborhood One Oak. of Manhattan. The One Oak, still there, yeah. I think, um, at yeah. least pre pandemic. And you know, he's there, he's hanging out. Um, then suddenly, you know, the, the, the well before closing time, like the, 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 the lights come on, the music goes out and they just start hurting everyone out of the, 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 the bar. They say it's close, you know, it's done, we're finished. Everybody needs to leave the bar. And they don't, no one says why, but you know, the lights are on, everyone's kind of orderly leaving the bar. Was there like a fire? You know, no, there's no fire drill, there's no fire alarm, but everyone's kind of wondering what's going on. As they are exiting the club, you know, you can clearly see, I, there's even CCTV footage of them leaving the club um, from several different angles and businesses then along the street. But you can clearly see there's like dome lights, um, there's cop cars, there's an ambulance. It's like a crime scene, you know, and there's the yellow tape and cops are um, roping off or cordoning off the street. And then there's a, just a bunch of blue shirt NYPD cops kind of directing people from One Oak um, toward the side streets, or actually one side street, it's 10th Avenue, I think it is there, um, and just getting everyone out, out of the way, moving everyone along. So Cephalosha and Andy, everyone is sort of not uh, literally listening to the cops. There's like a lot of like mingling on the, at the outside of the club, as you do, you know, when you leave a, an establishment like that, you know, there's mingling, people talking, chatting, people are recognizing Cephalosha and saying, you know, you know, good luck in the playoffs. Someone, you know, he's from Switzerland, so, French is one of his many languages, and someone says bon chance to him, and then he knows. So he and Antic are walking down the street. Now, at this moment, Cephalosha 
in his memory, uh, he says, you know, like there's one cop singling him out. And that, his uh, version of events is kind of corroborated by many witnesses um, and Piero, Antich, um, and it's singling that. And Antich, by the way, is like a giant of he, a, he, he, he's a I mean, he could easily be in the next Game of Thrones for sure. Yeah, like one of his friends he, called him like Xerxes. You know, he's like, yes. he looks he like this sort of right. warlord, you know, from right. you know, ancient Persia. He's right. he got a beast. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what it said in the story. <laughs> it does. It does. Warlord <laughs> mentioned that warlord. right from the story. <laughs> Resembling Evil. Xerxes. He's a huge man, yeah. Right, so, I mean, and he draws attention in the cloud, in the crowd, but somehow Cephalosha is the one who's drawing yeah. the attention. And Cephalosha, by the way, he's, what he's wearing, black jeans and a black hoodie with the hood up. So he feels like he's just sort of being, you know, dr- you know focused on by the police. Um, they get to the corner of this, the, whatever the numbered street is there, I can't, 23rd or 24th or something like that, and 10th Avenue, they're at the corner. There's actually a cab waiting for them. There's actually a cop holding the door open for them to get into like a livery cab, you know, one of those. Um, and they're about to get in and then uh, a, a kind of like a, a homeless guy or, or a person who was at the, um, the front of the club when they first went in and had asked Cephalosha for money on the way in. Cephalosha had not given this guy money on the way in, but he recognized him and he's now asking for money again. So Cephalosha decides to give him a $20 bill, pulls out money out of his, uh, out of his uh, wallet and is on his way to give the guy the, uh, the $20 bill. But one of the cops actually right before Cephalosha can give him the money, like just takes the guy by the arm and kind of leads him away. And Cephalo just kind of gets, you know, angry at that because like he, he kind of announced to the police, like, look, I'm not doing anything here. You know, I'm, I'm going in for money. I want to give this guy some money. He kind of announced it to the police. And he's kind of irritated then that the police kind of purposefully like are taking the guy away from him. And so he, yeah, he makes a stride. Yeah. He makes a stride toward, all this is captured on CCTV. He makes a stride toward uh, the homeless guy to give him the money, to press the money into his hand. But then that's when all of a sudden there's cops around him and he's kind of being moved like this. And it's almost like lions, you know, on the antelope, you know, like uh, from all sides. And then he feels like uh, as he's being tugged, he, you know, he kind of famously like within the hawk's circle, you know, says the words, relax, relax, you know, I'm, you know, in his Swiss French accent. Um, but you know, the, then he feels like a sharp sting to his leg. And that's the kind of kick that um, takes him down. And then you can see, you know, in the CCD footage, like just, they come down kind of on him, you know, and then they ended up breaking his leg. And then they, you know, they handcuff him. Piro also gets arrested that same day because he kind of, he taps a cop on the shoulder, say, what's going on? What are you guys doing? And then they put him in cuffs and they take him away. And then they're in the precinct for, you know, many hours waiting. And then the first call they make is to the, Hawks head of security, and then it goes on from there. Um, but then, you know, the 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 astounding thing is for, for everyone involved was that like, oh, you'd think the cops would just, or the the Manhattan DA, you know, would not go forward with the case, would just sort of drop the charges. Um, but well, they wasn't charged. Yeah, exactly. It was like obstruction of justice because it was a crime scene. And by the way, that was when. Um, the Indiana Pacers player, uh, Chris Copeland. Chris Copeland, the, the, the crime scene, by the way, was him getting stabbed. Such a crazy night. They didn't even know they were at the, the, the one of the, at the same time that night, by the way. Yeah. Then that, and the, but it, those stories kind of got confl- and conflated in the aftermath. And one of the things Cephalosha had to wrestle with was this kind of, you know, prejudiced notion of, you know, oh, these, these uh, rich um, players going out and partying, being bad, bad boys, you know, um, and, and that conflating it with the knife, you know, the knifing of another NBA player. Oh, come on. They didn't know they were there at the same time. How is that possible? So they, like, he had to deal with that kind of um, prejudice too. Um, but yeah, there was obstruction of justice for that crime scene. Like, you know, um, Whatever the charges for, um, you know, disobeying uh, or, or disorderly conduct is, is one of them. But I think those are the two main ones, right? They're all misdemeanors, you know, but they still carry jail time if you, you know, took it to trial and lost, actually. I think, I think the maximum was like two years or something. Um, hmm. But 
there was, there's was all these complexities, you know, like the Manhattan DA came back with a deal, like no jail time, some little bit of community service and we'll drop the charges though. It'll be erased, expunged from your record. But it was like this weird other thing. It wasn't like a full dismissal. It was like, you're still copping to the charge, but right. the charge will eventually be um, erased from your record. Right. That was the deal. And it, like, it turns out that it's extremely rare for the Manhattan or the New York City uh, prosecutors to drop cases like this at all, especially mm -hmm. against black people. It's rare, it's, it's slightly less rare for them to give a deal like that, um, where you have the, you cop to the charge, um, you say, yes, I did it, but you get it expunged. What That's most, how most of uh, criminal justice goes, right? It's some kind of a, some well, kind of deal like that, right? Most of the deals are the people plead guilty because they don't have million dollar lawyers right. like, like Tabo could afford. Um, right. He had leverage, like I will take it to trial. Like most people, they don't. They have to go sweat it out in Rikers. And, and, and then you have all these horror stories like, like that kid who spent three years on Rikers Island, away, essentially in the same limbo. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. So um, They fought for the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's part of the craziness too. Like, why would they do that? And there's all this like calculus of the, the, they knew that there was a civil suit coming from Tabo. So like for the DA to drop the charges would be to- um, Admit something admit that, but they had a weak yeah. case anyway. So like even taking a trial and they lose, that also would strengthen the inevitable civil lawsuit, the, the, you know, the suing of the NYPD that Chaba was going to do. So it was it's like, you know, in, in a way it was kind of Kafka-esque, you know, you're kind of, he's, Chaba became caught in this like bizarre, um, and there was a lot of waiting in between each of these like decisions, you know? Yeah. And he had a real injury. And he had a real injury, right. His leg was broken. Yeah. Season and, finished, and, that playoff run finished. And Scott, uh, forgive me for not knowing this for sure, but I, I, I've been listening recently to some Charles Barkley stories because of the whole Dream Team podcast, which is really cool. I, did did Tabo have any record at all prior to this? No. No. Yeah, I mean, my knowledge of him with teammates are, you know, as sweet and fine a person as you could have. One of them to be your son's best friend and your daughter's husband, just the greatest guy. He grew up like in uh, VV Switzerland. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? V E V Y. Pardon my. Whatever you say is going to be correct. I'm sure. <laughs> it's this gorgeous, you know, Swiss town with like yeah. the Al like Geneva is right there, and there's like the Alps are over there, and the vineyards, you know, kind of cascading down. And he, wow. he went to like you know, he's and his but his family history is extraordinary. I mean, that's part of the part, an integral part of the whole story. You know, his father is Patrick Cephalosha. Okay, oh, yeah. tell us all the whole thing. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, he was a, a musician and an Afropop, the, the Malapoets of South Africa. I hope I'm saying that right too. But I mean, he was a, a during the apartheid regime in South Africa, he was a, a protest like musician. He, he toured the world. Um, you know, and he was harassed, all, he was arrested countless times in South Africa. Like a, a, a member of his band was murdered by a, 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 a right suprem white supremacist uh, pro-apartheid regime vigilante. So his knife or his uh, throat was slit in his bed. He married, he met and fell in love with Tabo's mother, a white woman from Switzerland. They were harassed, she was thrown in jail. There were miscegenation laws, that meaning um, of course that white and black people were not allowed to marry or even be together. They, he faced 10 years in prison. She faced uh, the possibility of enforced abortion. This was in South Africa? In South Africa, yeah. she was living there in Johannesburg, and that's where she fell. She met and fell in love with Patrick, yeah. and oh. you know, then they had it. They uh, she got pregnant, and they were about to have this child, and that's why there's the whole like, uh, you know, these horrible apartheid laws. So they fled. They fled to her hometown in Switzerland, and that she was um, pregnant with Tabo's older brother. Wow. So this is part of Tabo's like life, you know, the story is the, his, his, the experiences of his mother and father. Um, and then there's some backstory of the police officer involved too, right? Right, so it was uh, two, three, uh, five cops were in that scrum that kind of brought Tabo to the ground. Um, uh, and, you know, they were, 
I, I wanted to hear their stories. So the, yeah. this is, has to do with the reporting of the, of, the, of the piece. You know, like, I believe that you have to do everything you can to hear everyone's story that you're going to be writing about in, in the piece. So I will do almost anything within the bounds of uh, ethical journalistic behavior to, to make people aware that I'll be writing a story about them, that they're going to appear in, and, and give them the details of what I found, share with them what I found, so that they can respond to it. I mean, I think you've got to, if you've, you've got to find all their contact information, email them, write a letter to their homes. Um, and then I, I feel too, like you got to knock on doors, you know, you know, get off your ass and knock on doors. Like the sign behind Harry Bosch says, <laughs> which is an ironic allusion to a cop show, um, <laughs> given the subject matter here. But, uh, so I, I, you know, you go through the NYPD uh, communications office and say, I, you know, I'm writing a story about this incident. These are the cops involved. It's public knowledge by that point that those were the cops involved. I had the names. You know, I, what, can I talk to them or what's the deal there? Of course, they say no. You know, can I talk to anyone? No. Police union? No. No, everyone sort of declines to comment. Um, I get their phone numbers. I do call. And you know, it's kind of intermittent. I leave messages on the phone, on their voicemail. I don't think I, I can't remember if I actually got any one of them on the phone. Anyway, I mean, I just, you know, so I actually found addresses and I went to their houses and knocked on the doors. This is why you're the best, Scott. This is badass. Yeah. And sometimes the addresses weren't them, weren't, weren't the police officers themselves. It was their parents or their family members. And, mm -hmm. you know, one said, get out of here, you know, don't. Don't talk, you know, the main kind of cop who was sort of leading the charge, who was really the one who to, to get agitated at Cephalosha. Yeah, I, I talked to him, I think on his doorstep, and he said, you know, I'm, no thanks, but no thanks, not talking to you. But then I went to the, one of the cops' houses, um, and in the testimony, uh, this, you know, all the cops testified, or I, th I don't know if all of them did, but at least three out of the five testified. And during this testimony, and without prompting, this police officer said, you know, my father's black and my mother's white, you know, just like Tavo. And so I, I did find that, you know, his father played for the New York Jets. And mm -hmm. he, he was a wide receiver for several years in the NFL. And he played college football at uh, Jackson State, which is a the historically black, black college there. And so I, I actually saw him on the, you know, I met him, shook his hand. When I first met him face to face, he's like, you know, he didn't want to talk, but then I called him later for follow-up. I got his phone number, I called him later for follow-up. And then it turns out that he was a student his senior year at Jackson State. He was there for a, a little, kind of a little known Kent State-like at police atrocity. I mean, they were protesting in Jackson State against the Vietnam War, also for civil rights. And the police with shotguns um, killed two students and injured 11, 12 other people. Wow. When he was a senior at Jackson State. So, I mean, it's like, this inescapable violence, you know, um, that just, that's almost the story of Tavo. It's like uh, at every level, you can't like, you can't escape it. You know, it's like everyone is trapped in this. Scott, uh, Scott are you saying that two college, uh, two black college students uh, protesting the Vietnam War were shot and killed and no one else ever really found out about it? No, it was known. It's a known. It's it is a known. known. It's I, I know Kent State station. really well. How many people there died? Four? Four, yeah. Four. So two but died. They, they were white. Let's be honest. Come that's on. That's my point. Right. Yeah, so sure. yeah, it's, it's just little known. Right. Yeah. Amazing. We've been, we've been talking a little bit how, how little we learned about Tulsa in yeah. our high school. I, yeah. nothing. Just I knew nothing about the Tulsa list. until yeah. the Watchmen. I knew nothing about it. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. That's amazing. So, did, was in this cop, did you get the sense that he was kind of wanting you to understand that he? felt the weight of this um does that make sense well or, i or no? i never did get to the his the son of the i yeah. could only talk to the father i was trying to convince his father to, to you know on my behalf you know um please you know try to tell richard castor i think um you know definitely want to talk to him but that never happened i never did talk mm. to really any of the police officers themselves unfortunately but um there's these details uh, it seems like uh that night as they're walking down the block this one cop, you write, seemed to be in a rage. And he says, get the fuck out of here. Cephalosha said something back. Um, 
he recalls a line largely corroborated by other witnesses. You can talk to people nicely. It works. And he said, it's because you have a badge that you're a tough guy. And then he replies, with or without a badge, I'll fuck you up. And then he did. Right? With a lot of help from other people. Yeah. Right. How did he you was the one that, like, that did the kick, if I'm not mistaken. How do we know this dialogue? How did you get that detail? Some of it is in a testimony at the trial. And then from Tabo Cephalosha. And then there were... Um, and then, you know, Tabo admits this. Um, he also, you know, said something to the cop that provoked him, you know, because the guy was a little bit on the... He said, you're five foot two, you're a midget. <laughs> right. So, he I mean, Tabo, you know, he, he did, you know, uh, insult the cop with words. But, I mean, that doesn't necessitate breaking someone's leg, you know. And you're allowed to do that, by the way. You're allowed to yell and scream at cops. And that's within your rights, actually. Um, but anyway... Uh, so how did it all play out? Uh, well, right. Did Tubbo win his lawsuit? Yes. He won the, first of all, he was acquitted by the, in this jury trial. Um, so yeah, they, I mean, all of these guys eventually did get, get on a stand and talk it out. So a lot of the dialogue comes from that, you know, it's from the, from the testimony. Um, but then, yeah, he's acquitted and then he sued. And then it was like $4 million, I think he won. But that was, you know, that played out again over a number of years after. Yeah. And you ended up talking to Tabo at some point. Oh yeah, at in at super long length. Yeah. How was and that? His whole family. What's that? I went, well, tell us about him. Yeah, I mean a sweet guy. I mean I went to Atlanta and hung out with him in Atlanta. Went to his house, met his wife, um, and his, his kids were going to school there at, at the time. So yeah, and had a long interviews, several of them with with him. You know, and also when he's. One of the great moments in the story is, you know, this kind of, um, you know, behind the scenes, like the personal story. Like he, at some point, he's got to tell his wife, um, you know, I was out at this nightclub, you know, at four in the morning, um, and she's kind of pissed at him, right? Like, yeah. what are you doing out? You know, what did you say to those cops? Like, she she sat him down and like grilled him, like you would think would happen in in a, in a long term relationship with someone. And he kind of got, you know, yelled at by and lectured to a little bit by his by his wife um was he was he angry i mean yeah how would you describe his feelings looking back at it and then i was also curious what if, if he had larger scale thoughts about uh police in america this is this is you know five years ago now and had he had issues like that before and not of course not a broken leg but any run-ins at all just with you know that he had talked about with you i don't know i have not spoken to him really since the story came out so i don't i don't really know yeah um so what was the question again? larger uh yeah what was he like what was it when he was talking to you was he angry was he more just you know business-like in the approach at that point well it had been several years so he had really a lot of time yeah. to reflect so it happened and right. i was reporting this i guess a year later um i was reporting it um so he had a lot of time to reflect and but even in the moment i think he told me like there was a paradox he felt both innocent and, and guilty at the same time you know Innocent because you know what he did did not necessitate let, a broken leg, let alone the getting charged with the crime that he was charged with. But he um, felt guilty for you know yeah being out late like just the same reason that you know he, he you know his wife you know, was had questions about like what were you doing out that did, late. But did he tell you that? that and also. He also, yeah, he was in the middle of that playoff run, so he felt guilty for getting injured, putting right. himself in a situation, getting injured, and then, like, you know, letting down his team. Like, I think that was probably the major. But know. he had just, you said he had just flown, right, Phoenix to New York. Yeah. And likely most of these guys sleep on those, play, on those trips west to east and was, I mean, was just awake. And they, what he did was actually pretty normal. Sure. For these guys on these trips, their sleeping habits are so messed up anyway. Totally. And not in every city can you go anywhere at four in the morning. You you typically just sit in your room in Oklahoma City or half the league and just read or whatever because you can't sleep. There's nowhere to go. New York City is one of the places where you actually can go somewhere. Exactly, and it was, I think that Phoenix Suns game was like really physical. Um, so it's, you can imagine someone getting just coming off that game being amped up. You know, like there's yeah. just adrenaline roar, roaring through. Oh, yeah, and then you know. The playoffs are coming up. You know, he really wanted to play in the playoffs and win a championship. Yeah, they were good that year. Yeah. Um, 
I remember when your story came out, um, a bunch of the reaction that I heard anyway was a little bit like what Gerard has said. Gerard will join us at the end as, as a tradition on the show. But um, when you said that you have the right to like mouth off to cops, basically, Gerard said it's some people's rights, Scott, right? Which is de facto how it works, right? So sure. uh, the, the most common thing I had was this, this line where, um, where Tabo says, um, you can talk to people nicely, it works. Like, you know, giving a little bit of lecturing to the cops, like, like black Americans are like, oh my God, this guy grew up in Switzerland and doesn't know the rules. Yeah. Right? He doesn't know that you can't talk like that. It's just you, right. you're, 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 there's a rule, right? That you're breaking. And Tabo was like, oh, I have rights. I'll act like someone who has a constitution behind him and, you know, some moral fiber in the police force and I will, we will have a disagreement. It'll be reasonable, right? And I think Americans just are like five alarm fire of, right? never, right? Never do that. Sure. This is even, the though he had, you know, even though he had a father who grew up and had yeah. to survive apartheid, you know, he still, yeah. yeah, he's from Switzerland. He never knew that South African, you know, um, he never knew apartheid because he grew up in Switzerland. Yeah. Although, that's, yeah. what I was, that's what I was wondering, Scott, is how was, what, when you were talking to Tabo, did he have an opinion about the typical police that he had been coming? I mean, they deal with policemen all the time in America, NBA players especially. You have security wherever you go. Uh, had, did he, do you remember him having any thoughts about uh, coming from where he came from and then being in America, how different it might have been? Yeah, he's certainly aware of it. I mean, there's like this moment, like even like four months before he had the altercation. You know, he was um, in New York City for a Knicks game and his, he was in a cab like going to the hotel. He's with, with his wife on this trip and um, there was traffic um, stopped and blocked off and it was a Black Lives Matter um, protest. Oh, there you go. It had to do with Eric Garner. Um, wow, right. And so he, and he tweeted something like, you know, in like sort of support of the protesters that day. Um, and and it had a hashtag on it, like, it could be me. Wow. Oh, there you go. How about that? Okay. Wow. But he was absolutely aware of all of the, all of this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Hard not to be when you have a father, again, who experienced a version yeah. of it in South Africa. And his father had an, uh, an amazing response um, to Tavo's injury. He was like, um, I was, he taught, his father said, I was relieved that Tavo only got injured and wasn't killed. Holy crap. That tells everything right there. Um, oh, look at this. Uh, uh, I just got a message from one of our viewers saying that eventually Tavo settled and NYPD made this statement. This settlement is not a concession that Mr. Cephalosha was blameless in this matter. And there was no admission of liability by the defendants. The resolution to this case is in the best interests of the city. How much pressure, blah, blah, blah. Um, wow, yeah. Well, Scott, you, you, you saw both sides. You're not a judge or jury, and, and you may or may not have a bias based on your conversation with those guys, but do you, do you agree with that statement that, that maybe Tava wasn't blameless, uh, uh, given that you are allowed to make fun of someone's size? <laughs> you can, and, and he was trying to give 20 bucks to a homeless guy? Yeah, he's pretty blameless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was acquitted. Yeah. How fast was the jury out for, do you know? Uh. Yeah, I read it in the article just Steph, when I reread this. Um, I think they, they finished with the proceedings like late in the afternoon. And then, so they deliberated for maybe 20 minutes the, on one afternoon. And they had, they, then the court was sort of adjourned. So everyone went yeah. home. And the next morning they come in. And I think it was like 15 minutes. So wow. like a half hour maybe, if you, on either side there. That's that. Right. Yeah. That's, a, that, that's about as fast as you could have. Yeah. Totally. That makes you feel good. Um, the one part of the process worked. Um, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's this, like, to me, like, I feel like, um, you know, Tabo's attitude on that block is actually something that you want, right? That means he's grown up feeling safe, right? It's a sign, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're, you know, it would be nice if every American had earned that attitude, right? Like if their experiences with the police had been such that they felt that they could have a dialogue, even a saucy one, right? Um, we're going to talk, I'm sure Drod's just dying to join us. Um, uh, Drod, do you want to join us right now? We just, do you, you want to talk? Do you want to do this? I think maybe you do. He's not going to say no. He's going to say yes. There he is. Hello. Oh, how are you? Hi, how's Hello. it going? Good. How are you, Scott? That was actually a, re a really good piece. Thank uh, you. 
No, I mean, my, my comments are generally what they always are, right? Like, the, what we're talking about, and I put this in the chat just now, yeah. when we talk about defunding the police, these are the kinds of things we're talking about, right? Like, you're talking about New Yorkers and New York City's taxpayer dollars going into these funds to pay these settlements for these blatant, abusive powers by police. I mean, they could have ended Cephalosha's career, right? Like, that could have actually stopped him from earning a living. And they're out here saying, that, you know, well, we take no blame for responsibility <laughs> on, on this. And it's just sort of like, wh where are we? Like, what, what even is this? And the interesting thing that, you know, I'm sure people realize, at least on this call, you know, Cephalosha's vantage point and viewpoint is different than a black American, is different than a West Indian American, right? Like, black, we're not a monolith, right? Like, we're, there's like, we are all very different. And his ability to think that like, oh, I can just say this thing because this is wrong. It's like, yeah, I know not to do that because I've been indoctrinated in this horrific culture. Like, he doesn't know that, right? And it's just, uh, and that in and of itself is like, should be a marker where people are like, oh, like, wait a minute, like, two dudes who are black think way different about, yeah, because that's how this works. And I just, you know, I'm hoping that this moment now with what's going on is, a, is you know, the, the reckoning that, that we all hope it is. I mean, I, I'm pretty cynical about that. I say no, but, you know, maybe. That's why Henry wanted Scott on the show. We need to talk about this kind of stuff, Gerard. We need your, we need Scott's views and as he so eloquently described, but we also need your wrath and indignation. <laughs> we, need, we need to get all this out and then people like Henry and I can continue to talk about it to our people too. Um, there's like a public private thing, right? I often feel like, uh, like what's the right thing to do, right? So privately, if you're Tabo's friend, right? Not setting public policy, right? But if you're just like advising him on how to have a safe night, the answer is act cowed, right? The answer is to like, you know, just we all know the rules here, right? Um, mm -hmm. Publicly, right? What should the policy be, right? To me is like, you know, every freaking citizen has freedom of speech, right? <laughs> like everyone should not just have in writing the ability to talk like that, but the real earned safety of like, over time, I think it's good, right? It is good. I think it's good for the government, in this case, the police to hear a little feedback from when they're getting close to a line, right? That's like a, anyway, yeah. David, David brought up a good point in the chat, Henry, and I don't remember this. Did the NBA and or the PA say anything about this when it happened? I don't recall off the top of my head. Let's just ask Scott. <laughs> yes, yes. The Hawks, you know, we're pretty, we're fully behind Tavo. And then, um, the players' union, for sure. Uh, Michelle Roberts, right? Is that? Yeah. yeah. She, uh, you know, she's like a former, uh, like a lawyer, super, like a oh, super lawyer. A super partner from Scadden Art. She's the real deal. Yeah. And she was like a, a public defender in yep. DC, right. which was like the grooming ground for legal minds. Um, so, and she's both defended cops, you know, on one side, and, and when she was a public defender, like, you know, uh, helped people who were in the same situation as Tabo, were victims of police brutality. So she was like, you know, really behind it, you know, and the, and the players unions, lawyers were always involved. If I'm not mistaken too, so yeah. Um, Henry, I, I think that, I think the case, there's a, there's an aspect to this and Scott described it right at the very beginning. Well, we're seeing a, a common thread in a lot of these issues we're dealing with now that we see on TV all the time and are reading about where there really, there really didn't have to be anything that happened. There, was, it, there, there wasn't a shootout to begin with, right? There wasn't a melee. This was, if, you, if your point of view as a police officer, and I coach players, so I'm sensitive to this, that are police officers now, and so I talk to them about this. If, 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 their, if their mission was delivering peace, making sure peace is kept, this was low-hanging fruit. The cab is there, the door is open, he's giving him $20, just let it go. We, we could apply this to so many cases where something way worse than a broken leg ultimately occurred, as bad as a broken leg was. This is something we could really mount pressure on, of, of changing the dynamic towards making that happen, right? That should be the idea, to make, help things get peaceful. And or if there's a nut job in uniform, right? then you can't close ranks, right? Like, Absolutely. You know, like, point, if, of course. like, okay, something terrible happened here. But now the whole, you know, everybody testifies 
And the conclusion, and it's very important for everyone to say that this was normal and justified, like wrong answer, right? Completely wrong answer. Like if something terrible happens, we have to call the terrible thing, right? If some guy gets his ankle broken for giving someone a $20 bill, like we need to say that's a tragedy, right? We, it's important. Didn't a bunch of people, didn't a bunch of police officers, uh, guys just quit in Atlanta when they charged their, their brother with yeah. murder? They just quit? It's like self-defunding the police. No, we, 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 we <laughs> my shrug gif right now. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. 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 My, even my son, my son was saying he thinks a lot of them are quitting because they agree with, with the, the idea that the mostly media has, which is these things are terrible. And I told, I said, Max, I'm, I hope you're right, but that's not what I've been reading. Yeah. I don't think that's why this video told us a couple of days ago. I don't know if you guys saw it, and I don't know where she is a police officer in, but the, the, the cop who cried about her Egg McMuffin because she's worried about like, someone like, trying to kill. So now it's this whole, like, what was me? And it's like, look, again, I, I sympathize and empathize with anybody who deals with anxiety and stress and pressures and all that. But, yo, know, when you have that job, I'm sorry. Like, you have literally the power of life and death at your fingertips. You have to be better than everybody else. Those are just the rules, right? It's the same thing with pilots and pe people who are responsible for lives. That's how that goes. And if you can't do that, well, maybe that ain't the job for you, right? Like, well, and I also think there's like, you know, are we saying that, you know, there's the bad apples, like, you know, either we're saying these things are on video. We know a lot of terrible things have happened, including this top of self thing, right? Either it's an outlier event or it's representative of the police force as a whole, right? They're kind of two choices. So, we need to treat them. We need to isolate the bad actors and punish them and say they did bad things. Or the woman getting her egg McMuffin is carrying that with her, with her uniform, right? Like the story up to, through most of US history has been like, no, 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 like thin blue line, like, you know, we're all on the same team. And like, well, now you're all on the same team and your egg McMuffin is gonna be jeopardized, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I, I operate from the, present, from, the, from the vantage point that at a minimum, half this population is racist. That, that's, that's where I operate, at a minimum. It's probably more than that, probably closer to 75%, right? So if that is the case, what do we think the police department is made up of, right, all over America? So these isolating bad actors, it's a whole thing because this is how we've all been racialized being brought up here. Like, it's in the, it's in the very fabric of everything we do. And it's, it's a problem, right? Like, and the work to not be that way takes work and it's constant. And, People either A, aren't willing, B, don't. I mean, there's so many different reasons why it's not happening. So this idea of, all right, fire this cop, whatever, great. It's going to happen tomorrow, right? Like, and it does. Next day, it happens again. Scott, yeah. what do you think? We like to say in the show, and historically, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's a line I stole from someone long ago. You, you study the NYPD through the, the pigeonhole or the, the eye hole of this story. What would you talk about, what would you think and say about the culture that you witnessed with the NYPD? I mean, I, it's, it's get back to the institutionalized, you know, racism. Like, it's like a, you almost have to stop thinking about individuals as like a system. It's just a systemic thing. And it's a kind of element of being trapped, you know, like, it's hard not to be a little gloomy, um, I guess, sometimes, you know, because it's like, there's no escape, you know, and how, how do you, how do you even go about, you know, but I, you got to work to be optimistic, I guess. But, you know, I know Tabo kind of felt trapped, you know, like uh, coming from Switzerland and then, you know, suddenly um, this happens and he's a, kind of a civil rights symbol or a minor one that he never really wanted to be. Right. But he is now. And so, I mean, his fame will be this instant. It won't be his NBA career, right? This is what he'll be known for probably. He's not a superstar enough, right? So that's, there's this kind of, tragedy there too in a way right like, has, he, has he tweeted recently guys about this at all i i don't follow players anymore. about it recently somewhere um i think the athletic or something i thought i just pulled it up let me see if i can find it <clears throat> didn't his teammate write a players tribune story about it too kyle corver right yeah oh yeah 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 um he did um all right so we have a little bit of time left and Scott also wrote another story that was mind blowing, which is yes. he wrote the Tim Donaghy story um, years after the event, right? And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the new stuff you learned in reporting that story, Scott? Well, yeah, it's a year ago or more than a year ago now that it was published. 
the whole idea was to revisit it on the 10th anniversary. So the, I started reporting it in 2017 and <laughs> a while ago, blew yeah. a couple of deadlines there. <laughs> Finally, last year came out. But yeah, it was like, you know, just the feeling that, you know, the whole story had not been told. Um, you know, the official line was that he had not fixed games in sort of every way. If you ask like just a random person on the street, you know, what do you know about this NBA gambling scandal from like 10 years ago? And if they had known about it at all, they would have said, oh, you mean the ref who fixed games? So like in the public imagination, like it was he fixed games, but the official line was that he had not, you know, and, and like that we had proved that he had not, you know, we, we had this external investigation. We hired this outside law firm to do an investigation we analyzed the data and we could find no evidence of fixing. So um, it was felt like there was an untold story. And then it also, you know, who made the money from this stuff? You know, that felt like it also had not fully been told. You know, the whole underground gambling world, the colorful underground gambling universe um, and who might have been involved in that. So we felt like, you know, all of that stuff. And then also, you know, the Supreme Court ruling that, you know, recently that sort of is legal, going to legalize gambling, you know, that, saying that the states can decide, which is going to mean that it's going to be legal everywhere, I think, in the United States, kind of decriminalizing sports gambling. Um, so that's just going to unleash, you know, billions of dollars into the betting markets, which would potentially increase the um, incentive to match fix, you know, like the the, the, the theory is that, oh, you legalize gambling, and I believe this to a degree, it, you know, it, sh it should you know, throw sunlight onto the, it should make everything transparent. It, it'll behave like a financial market. Everyone will be, you know, betting and uh, you'll be able to see if there's max, match fixing pretty easily. American sports are thought to be immune to sports fixing because the athletes just make too much, so you can't really bribe them. Um, anymore, unlike 1919 when they didn't, when they didn't make anything at all. I'm talking about the White Sox baseball gambling scandal. Right. But you know you can always get to refs, right? So like that's the that's the way in if you're going to fix a game in mo modern times, and you see that in foot in soccer, international soccer, like that's really a problem over over there, um, and with refs. So it's, and if you're going to pick a sport where they you, you really the ref really does control things to an outsized degree it's going to be basketball so all that went into revisiting the story and there's this crazy scene i mean the fbi comes to the nba in a small meeting and says uh we think that this ref is doing something and we want him to wear a wire and see if other refs are involved right right <laughs> yes Yes. And then, then the, what happens after that is just bananas. Can you tell us that? Well, yeah, the FBI has to inform the NBA that one of, you know, that one of their refs is potentially involved in this gambling thing and they're going to continue to investigate. And then like a little while later, um, it's on the front page of the New York Post. Like someone, someone leaked it, you know. Whoops. <laughs> And the FBI is like, we didn't do that, you know, because you know, it is kind of true that they are really, they're pretty closed mouthed um, when the investigation is ongoing. Although sometimes they will leak if it's in their interest to do so. But so that leaves the NBA, right? Because no one left to leak it. Who's it going to be? Um, and but, now we know we won't have what could have resulted from him wearing a wire, which is a giant referee scandal, right? Now, yes. How convenient. Although, <laughs> that's the conspiracy theory although you know i looked into the other ref theories and i didn't i couldn't really find much there to be honest yeah. so i don't know if it would have led to but in the nba's mind maybe you know in that was the strategy like they didn't know either so leak it and end it well i guess i i i'm 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 game for some conspiracy theorizing and i'm even prone to it myself but in this particular case it legitimately means that donaghy can't wear a wire because he's been on the cover of a tabloid so he would be used to wearing a wire, right? right? Or, like it, or it, it also killed. Means. It also killed the maybe a wider investigation into the gamblers. You know, like who's right. who's who is making the money, and then kind of saying, yeah, right. And then there's some. I should look it up. I'm sorry to test your memory here. There's some line, about like, Stop. like these people are. There's kind of a threatening line about like the people who leaked the story to the tabloid are serious people who mess you up or something like this. You remember that? <laughs> Oh yes, like um, 
<laughs> that was the New York Post reporter who said, yes yeah who, who he was the one who got who, who he swears that was not from the NBA okay uh, no, yeah. or he more, more it's more like I'm not going to tell you he, he's like any report he's protecting the source right so yeah it's got I do wonder more of a procedural process question for you when you're interviewing and you're you're reporting and you're you know talking to subjects does it ever come to a point where okay obviously you pitch an idea to an editor and that's the story you're working on but then I mean it's just like you uncover this whole other thing or this whole different angle but you might be limited by words like do you file that away for another day or are you like you know let me Scott's not limited by words <laughs> <laughs> wait a second I do file long it is true <laughs> um, but even in the Donahue story, there's like all kinds of stuff on the cutting room floor, especially about that gambling underworld. I mean, there's just, it, it, it could spin off some stuff. It's just a fact, like so many characters, like, yeah. Hmm. Is there anything you want to tell us about now? <laughs> well, just to me totally tantalize what you just said. Yeah, the couple, couple, of, the, couple of the gamblers behind the, behind the scenes, like this guy, yeah. Taylor Breton, who died of a heart attack, but he was like this, they called him Popeye. He was just, uh, lived this crazy life, you know, there's, there were cutting room floor stuff about being the bookie for Michael Jordan, potentially, you know. How old was he when he died? Not, couldn't corroborate that. Um, I think he might have been in his 50s. So he, heart attack, you mean. <laughs> no, <laughs> he, 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 he did. He died on the operating table. Uh, that, that much is oh, true. Um, Everyone dies of heart failure, David. That's the list of the corners report, right? Like, <laughs> um, and, and who did make, well, actually, there's one, there's one part that I, I, was always tantalized by, which was the line moves you know, the, as the as the scandal unfolded and more people clued into what was happening. Yeah. The amount of money being bet on Donnie games got so ridiculous that you could see it in the line moves, which implied it was far more than just this tiny band. Of Correct. That they couldn't there. keep a lid on it. So, you know, the people, right. these gamblers, they study the lines. So right. people picked up on something weird happening. They and other people it kind of radiated out from the right. from the source, and then other people started like following. Like they could, they knew how to do that. They could follow the bets being made by the Donahue core group, even though Donahue himself didn't even know. Like, right. He this, was getting his five grand or two grand or whatever. And like, and meanwhile, like hey. millions were, like he, they couldn't place all the bets. So the thing that always cracked me up was um, sports gamblers are like, oh my God, like words kept secret ever, right? And meanwhile, the NBA is like, we have experts from, you know, they rattle off like every three letter agency and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, we have our, our pipes into Vegas. Like you wouldn't believe it. It's like, well, how come everybody knew except you guys? <laughs> right. <laughs> Where were the tipsters there? <laughs> Making money is what they were doing. Mm, but following and telling the NBA, yeah, we don't see anything here. Did, yeah. did you ever interview, did any of you ever interview, uh, was it uh, Jack Delaney? Was that his name? Delaney. The, the referee that was, uh, used to work for the FBI, I think. Uh, oh, yo, yeah. I have his book here. Um, not, um, yeah. Yeah. He wrote yeah. a book. That's right. I, when I was doing my training at IMG for years, he was there frequently. He actually yeah. was a, he was a character. Yeah. You character. could do a movie on that dude's life. Yeah. Yeah. I got a little one-on-one -on -one time with him in some hotel lobby when his book came out and I ever had in my head, I'm like, Oh, we're going to get this kind of like unvarnished view behind the scenes and how this works. But like, it ended up being like, so like, like every single person in a badge was like a hero in the history. You know what I mean? Like, like it was so down the line. I was just like, oh, I don't even like, okay, I see. <laughs> I get it. Like you gotta say that. Okay. But yeah, I can't believe I don't remember his name. Um, yeah. Jack Delaney, right? I think that's right. Really? Maybe I'm wrong. It's been a while. It's been 12 years for me since I probably saw Older him. men being broadcast. Like, I don't know his name. Like. <laughs> <laughs> they've been making that. all the connections between uh donaghy and all the culture and scott foster i mean foster is like the number one like rep of every team that like hate like when he shows up for your game you're like we're losing the night scott foster's here <laughs> he's like he's like the referee's referee like he just absorbs <laughs> the animosity of <laughs> yeah the world he's yeah. like bob delaney that's what it is it was bob, bob delaney. delaney um okay. thank you Devin. Okay. um uh yeah there's like who knows, case by case, you know, obviously Scott told this incredible story of like this Donnie story is off the rails, but um, the other referees and the vague implications and the insinuations, I don't know. But I know that like one thing that really struck me was in the wake of all this, um, 
there's a Steve Nash quote in a Jack McCallum's book where basically Steve Nash says to his then coach, Mike D'Antonio, basically like, like, do you think this is all true? Like, do you think that these things are all rigged? And like, he doesn't say it in those exact words, but um, I was like, wow, if, if the trust is so low that it's Steve Nash's level of involvement, he's profoundly concerned that the referees might be called deciding games for corrupt reasons. Right. Like I was like, that's a, that's a institutional crisis, right? Like you need Steve Nash to be the one who goes out and says, these referees are amazing. Right. And the fact that in a private moment, I guess in front of Jack McCallum, he's saying uh, that he thinks it might be rigged. Like that's a, that, that's where the rubber hits the road. Right. This is where, for sure. I mean, that's the whole idea. That's why they're so afraid of match fixing scandals because it just undermines everything. Like that, it is yeah. existential to, to yeah. a sports league. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you're professional wrestling, which right. is just all scripted. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit like, like the McMuffin story, where it's like, yeah. you, you can sweep a lot under the rug, but it's still under the rug. And then it comes out not on your schedule, <laughs> right? Like, like, if you get away with it for a week, fine. But if you get over a decade or 20 years, now you have to really kind of sweat it because, like, there's, a growing collection of things under there. I feel like this is a little bit like, I don't know. To me, the NBA's impulse hasn't been like, oh, let's clear the air, right? It's been like, no, no, nothing to see here. We got a report. Well, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Like, it's how much of it, because we all love sports here and we love the NBA, which is why we're on this show. Do, and is this a moment now where we figure out how we prioritize sports societally, right? Like, because it can't be a situation where all of these things are happening everywhere else in society, but doesn't happen within the NBA. It, like, it has to, right? If cheating's going on out there, it's going on in here too. Like, it's not like this is a bu bubble. See what I did there? It's like, this is a <laughs> place where nothing that goes on here doesn't happen out. And, right? So, I mean, it's what it is. We should not be surprised. Gerard, are you arguing for a truth and reconciliation commission in sports? <laughs> And we're going to get me in trouble out here. Sure, why not? I'll, I'll be on that. I'll be you on don't that. have to sign up for that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so all in all, the Scott, like, how would you rate the scale of 1 to 10 if, if the NBA says, take my word for it? <laughs> you... I mean, I think all sports <laughs> leagues you have to – almost like – it's like covering uh, corporations. Like, um, you know, I've written about business forever for many years and, like um, – I mean, you try to be neutral, but uh, I, so many times they're acting on bad faith and just uh, trying to pull one over on you. So you, they're, they're, they're obstructing, you know, they, they, there's just so many instances where corporations, big business, you know, just d engaged in wrongdoing and is trying is covering it up and lying to journalists. Yeah. It's, just, it's happened so many times and the sports leagues are at no different at all. There is no taking anyone's word for it. No. They did Don't actually your work. Yeah. After your story came out, Scott, the NBA like replied in a manner I thought it was fascinating. They quibbled on some stuff, but they didn't dispute anything about this like stuff leaking from the FBI meeting. Like there was no mention of that. I thought that was wild. Right. I mean, that is one of the mysteries. I can never quite get to you know to show that oh the NBA did leak this and here's how they did it. I, you know, I couldn't get that far. But yeah, no, it's hard to do. It is. Um, okay, well, almost out of time. Anything else? Anyone want to? Any, anything you want to add? Anyone? Scott, are we allowed to ask you if there's anything you're focused on now? I am at work on a couple of non-sport stories for other what? publications. Yeah. We just got done talking <laughs> about that. What do you mean? I on. did go to. I did go to the my last reporting trip before the pandemic. Uh, I was in Peru, oh, in normal, the yeah. rainforest, and there were guys brandishing machetes i will just oh, say that mm. when can we look forward to reading that yeah i look forward to writing it <laughs> <laughs> we do too we're on your side buddy how can we help <laughs> i don't know there's homeschooling to do and uh yeah ah. trying to do it trying to get it done wait, wait brandish Scott. in that sense brandish means like actively presenting yeah wow oh, okay yeah okay <laughs> Henry, do you and Scott have the same thing where like you go out and you're reporting and you get all this juicy stuff and you're so excited that you're like, crap, I gotta write about it now. Like, yeah. you know, like all the time. Oh, this is the best part. <laughs> like, I gotta write. Yes. <laughs> but now I we're gonna like be, writing, to be honest. Now we're gonna date you the same thing, except no one's gonna have machetes. Like, how do you beat the machete story? <laughs> That's oh. the story. 
<laughs> There's always more machetes, David. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I hope there are no more machetes. <laughs> All right. Awesome. This has been so great. I really love hearing about um, just that story, the way you tell it is, is it takes me back. Um, and I feel like it's important now. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks, um, God. Be safe, guys. Thank you, guys. All right.